the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
welcome to this evening's Ideas Exchange. When these conditions arise, we arise too. And I think that sometimes limitation is good for artistry and good for creativity. You're in a situation where you're like, well, is it worth it? You cannot be an effective leader if you shortchange yourself. I love asking why. That is my favorite question to ask, is just the why. Take that passion and do something great with it. Save the world. I don't have any more secrets. And that is a wonderful way to go through life. Thank you all for watching this story, video, post, whatever this is. Thank you so much. Bye. Good evening, Los Angeles, or wherever you're joining us around the world. And welcome to Censored by China, Defending Creative Expression in a Global Market. This is an LA Times virtual ideas exchange event in partnership with PEN America. Speaking of PEN America, I'm James Tager, Research Director at PEN America. PEN America is a literary and free expression advocacy organization. We champion the freedom to write, recognizing the power of the word to transform the world. We're entering our centenary, centenary year this year, and uh, PEN America continues to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and to defend the liberties that make it possible. It's really my privilege to uh, introduce this event today. Um, PEN America's work on this, a lot of it draws back from our August 2020 report called Made in Hollywood Censored by Beijing, where we looked at the issue of Chinese governmental influence and censorship and the way it was playing a role in influencing the movies that Hollywood was making. At the time, I thought of it as an iceberg issue, which is to say that the um, amount of the issue that could be seen by the average American theater goer or by the average global theater goer was actually su substantially less than what was actually happening. And to kind of pull back the curtain on a lot of this, we have some incredibly knowledgeable people on this panel today. It's really going to be an exciting one. We have people like Rebecca Davis, who has been covering this uh, issue and whose work I've personally been following for years. Author Eric Schwartzel, who has literally written the book on the subject. And of course, Robert and Michelle King, um, Hollywood insiders in an issue where frankly, insiders do not often speak about this issue. So it's really gonna be a tremendous event. Let me just ask a question to kind of frame some of this, which is, why is this such an important issue? And I would say that it's because this, Hollywood is the most important storytelling center in the world. And in this conversation, we'll be talking about how it's increasingly subjecting itself to the whims and wills of government censors motivated by a political agenda under an authoritarian government. Perhaps the biggest issue is not the stories that are influenced or shaped, but the stories that will never be told because Hollywood is increasingly sort of receiving the message about what can and cannot be made. Ultimately, this is an issue of artistic freedom. Well, with little further ado, I'm gonna turn us over to Scott Kraft, the managing editor of the LA Times and someone who is a veteran journalist in every sense of the word, someone who's directed uh, multiple Pulitzer Prize winning um, pieces of reporting. And I'm really excited to turn it over to him and to start this conversation, Scott. Thank you, James, for that generous introduction. All of us are in awe of the work that Penn does, so thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in to this Ideas Exchange in partnership with Penn America. Just so you know, we'll be doing three more of these in 2022. Our conversation tonight will focus on censorship in China and especially the impact it has on the business of entertainment in the global marketplace from talented creators to avid consumers. It's a high stakes financial story, of course, a geopolitical story too, 
and a story about free expression and the East-West rivalry. But it's also a story about movies, television, and cultural protectionism used as a weapon. We'll be talking about how the business of telling stories in Hollywood is influenced by Beijing, often in ways that are not always evident. And we'll also be talking about what that means for all of us. I'm really pleased to welcome our panelists for this evening. We'll begin with uh, Rebecca Davis. Rebecca was the first China Bureau Chief of Variety and a longtime China watcher with a deep knowledge of the film business. Eric Schwartzel is a film industry reporter in the LA Bureau of the Wall Street Journal. He's also the author of the just published and very well-reviewed book, Red Carpet, Hollywood, China, and the Global Battle for Cultural Supremacy. A little plug here, our partner bookseller is Skylight Books, and you can get red carpet there. And finally, we're fortunate to have with us Robert and Michelle King, the award-winning writing team whose credits include some of the most popular, edgy, and topical, and it goes without saying entertaining, shows on television. The Good Wife, The Good Fight, Evil, and Your Honor, among many others. Welcome to the panelists. It's really good to be with you. I wanted to begin, um, I think I'll begin with you, Eric, if I could. Your book makes the point that we as moviegoers are frequently in the dark about creative decisions. Um, casting, plot twists, locations, and those decisions often have their roots in a fear of Chinese censors. Even in one case you mentioned in the book of airbrush, airbrushing out laundry drying on a clothesline in Shanghai. Could you talk a little bit about how that works? What are the unwritten rules there? And, and I guess, how can we train ourselves to notice it? Right. Um, no, it's, first of all, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm so happy to be doing this panel tonight. And um, I think you're right. A lot of times um, the changes that are being made in some ways because they're they're subtle and in others just because you wouldn't know to look for them are, are prevalent in so many blockbusters being produced by Hollywood today. Um, the, the two dynamics I think to keep in mind are one is that China now has the number one box office in the world. And over the past decade, that box office has been growing at a clip while American ticket sales at the theater have been flatlining. So studios over the past decade have reoriented business plans to ensure access to those Chinese theaters. Before getting into those Chinese theaters, though, they need to be approved by Chinese censors at the Ministry of Propaganda. And that means only making movies and sending them movies that they're going to approve. And, and, and the kind of changes that come are, are large and small. And, and so you said, you, you were right, that in, in Mission Impossible 3, they had to edit out laundry that was drying in Shanghai because it made the country appear more backwards than the authorities would have liked. But it goes beyond the cosmetic. It, it can often get quite political in, in what tripwires will form. And I think the distinction to draw when we're talking about Chinese censorship is that a lot of countries change movies before they are shown in their theaters. You know, Saudi Arabia is taking things out of movies. Indonesia is taking things out of movies. The difference with China is it is doing so on a scale that Hollywood has never seen before. And that economic leverage has also meant that it changes movies, how movies are shown outside its own borders. So that means ensuring that Hollywood studios don't touch themes that Chinese authorities wouldn't like, even if those themes are explored in movies that we're never going to get into China anyway. That is the key difference here, is that it's a censorship that goes beyond just the censor saying, we're not going to let this scene in or this line of dialogue into Chinese theaters. It's if we find out you're making a movie in the U.S. and distributing it anywhere that we don't like, there could be repercussions for that as well. Just a few years ago, um, Hollywood studios saw, you know, the China market as a great opportunity. Movie theater attendance was down. Streaming services uh, were starting to produce their own content, and they were looking like a threat uh, to studios. They went big into the China market, and at first, they did pretty well with big, big budget blockbuster movies. And and today, China made movies are killing it at the box offices in China, and the big budget, budget films can't seem to get approved for release. What, what happened there? And how did censorship play a role in that? Well, I think that it, it Hollywood learned pretty quickly 
what rules they had to follow, right? Because there were some very public examples of movies that didn't get into China or that angered authorities. So this goes back to the 90s before the market was even a consideration for any studio chief when uh, Disney and Sony made two dueling movies about a young Dalai Lama and then saw their parent companies kicked out of the country. Didn't take long for other studios to know, okay, the Dalai Lama, Tibet, that's off limits. Um, and I think the, the economic leverage grew as China's box office grew, but something was happening concurrently that was quite fascinating, which is that China's film industry was commercializing at quite a clip. And Chinese audiences started more and more to prefer to see Chinese movies. And I think in Hollywood, this came as something of, of a surprise. I think some kind of mix of complacency and ego led Hollywood executives to think that they would their product would always be the preferred option. When in reality, Chinese audiences started to see better Chinese movies on the marquee and started going to see those more and more. So we're at a we're at a point now that, I mean, over the past three to six years or so where the the market has grown more competitive for Hollywood overall. And then in the past year or so, the government has made it even harder to compete by instituting all of these controls. It appears as though right now the Chinese authorities have decided that they are going to put stricter walls up when it comes to what Western films they let into the country. And last year, this really took a turn whenever there was a string of movies, um, many of which would have typically sailed onto Chinese screens like Black Widow, Shang-Chi, even that Spider-Man movie that almost single-handedly rescued the American theatrical business. None of those films got into China last year. Instead, the market was pretty much completely reserved for those Chinese domestic releases. And it feels to me like it's an example of China turning inward. We're, we're seeing this elsewhere in, in all kinds of sectors and in all kinds of ways where China's government in an effort to perhaps bolster some nationalism or cut ties, cut, cut some of these economic threads that it's, that it's woven itself into with the West. They're trying to turn that inward and be a little bit more of an internal power. Makes sense. I, I'd like to ask Robert and Michelle about the challenges facing creators. The compelling plot lines of your shows are often drawn straight from the headlines. And I know you've been at the cutting edge of this issue and, and have direct experience with it, including a clash with CBS over an animated segment in an episode of The Good Fight, I believe. <clears throat> As I understand it, <clears throat> a song in The Good Fight was cut and replaced with the words, CBS has censored this contact, content which I gather was a compromise that came after your protest. And yet other parts of the episode did have some pretty tough things to say about oppression in China, things that were left in. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that went down and how, as creators, you and others are navigating this new landscape. Well, uh, what I would say actually to start is that what's surprising, frankly, is how much is not touched. That as you said, the bulk of that episode was unflinching and spoke, you know, rather harshly about certain things that were going on. And we did not get pushback about it. There was, as you point out, uh, an animated short, a, a song for about a minute uh, that CBS at the last minute said we could not include in the episode. And uh, when we, uh, protested, they said, all right, they agreed to run just that it was censored by China, or excuse me, by CBS. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it, it was very awkward, only because the minute and a half short, which was a Jonathan Colton written song, and we had animated, it, was about how America censors itself before their product can get into China. And then CBS censored itself before uh, they would let it out. And so it was a, in the height of irony. It felt like you're in some meta movie because every step of it was kind of a, a mirror room reflecting back on itself. And the episode, as Michelle said, was kind of tough. It was, um, I think it was like the fifth episode of that season. It had Alan Alda representing uh, a company that is suing a tech company, like uh, we call it Chum Hum, but it's basically inspired by Google or uh, you know Facebook. 
and they are sending their technology into China and it's being used to uh, find Uyghurs and Uyghur sympathizers. So the argument, it, it, the name of this software was called Praying Mantis. And so the argument of the episode was how much you know, American technology that we appreciate and helps for freedom is using often by totalitarian regimes to find dissenters. So it was just this minute and a half in the middle of the episode that CBS was worried would put them on the wrong side of things. Uh, otherwise, my God, I mean, we get away. It's a crazy what we get away with. Um, <laughs> so we're not always the best example of the the chilling effect of this kind of censorship because we're doing other episodes. This thing, this may be a surprise to CBS, but we're doing episodes this season on the same subject. Um, so the only thing we'd say, you know, we know from other showrunners, we know they are up against the wall on a lot of these issues. We haven't had the same thing except in this minute and a half sequence where we had threatened to quit and then they allowed a, a title to go on that we asked for that CBS censored this content. I, for better or worse, we don't seem to be in the blockbuster business. So perhaps <laughs> that's one of the reasons. I think also when when CBS put that on the screen that some people were kind of confused. Thought that might CBS, have been did, a joke. CBS didn't do it, we did it. But CBS so agreed did. to it. So go ahead. I but I mean, otherwise, no. everything you said was true except the heart of it. We put it up there. <laughs> uh, did you? And I thought that the song that was not played in that episode had a reference to The Good Wife as well, which did, was, did that play in China or was, was it playing in China and then removed or what happened there? Um, there was uh, in that song, which again was written by Jonathan Colton. It's about how uh, CBS, uh, when uh, Good Wife was originally shown on CBS in the second season, we did this thing about Chinese professor being tortured. And again, it was about technology being used in China to locate dissidents. And uh, we seem to have only one subject, although Good Wife and Good Fight deals with a lot of subjects. Um, when we did that in this song, we referred back to that, that uh, Good Wife, and in that case, I think Big Bang Theory were censored in China, and that uh, these are the things you cannot mention or you will be censored in China. So it's best to correct these things before you send it into the Chinese market. It's a very satirical song, almost an instruction booklet of the things to avoid if you want to make money in China. And as you were saying, uh, some people thought it was a joke, the, uh, the placard that said, uh, this has been said. That was never our intention and came as a surprise to me personally that it was after it aired that, you know, we were asked by family members, were you kidding? And it was like, oh dear, no, we, we weren't. And, and so that was an unfortunate byproduct. It seems like there's some, um, there is preemptive self-censorship that seems to go on, although maybe it doesn't happen at the creator level. Maybe it's one level up or at the, at the studio or the distribution outlet. Where, where does that, I assume that you feel it a little bit, even though you're surprised at what you can get away with. I, I realize the politic answer is to agree with you and say, yes, we're, we're quieted down on these issues. The reality is we're not. We, we have not been asked to hold back, except for this one uh, animated song that that was not going to be able to go into an episode. Other than that, we haven't been asked to pull back. And and as Robert mentioned, we we've touched on this issue in a few episodes on a few different shows. I mean, it kind of highlights how uh, how difficult it is to kind of anticipate if you were trying to anticipate what China might find offensive, because as you say, there's so much criticism, there's so much criticism of China in some of your shows, yet that might not trigger. Uh, it's not that difficult to anticipate. I think we just choose not to, because honestly, <laughs> if we were trying to anticipate, we would have pulled back. Now that may be the difference between the features that Eric's talking about yeah. and what we're dealing with. But I think at a certain point, we have enough, uh, I'll use that word, clout within CBS 
that we can say, this is what we're going for. Do you have any issues with it? And, uh, and they said not. Even in the, in the, we showed the, the song, we played them the song, we showed them the storyboards all the way up to the mix. So a week before we were broadcasting, it was all, all steam, full steam ahead. And then they censored it at that point. It was not a happy you're, moment. So your advice to uh, younger uh, uh, content creators who maybe don't have the clout you have would be to just go for it and and try to be, you know, try not to self-censor, certainly. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's insane. Concerned. Why, you know, that would be crazy, especially in the world where we're on the verge of some World War III. Are you really going to let some other totalitarian regime tell you what to write? I mean, that's that's almost embarrassing. I mean, why not give it up and go into another business? That's true. Um, I, I know. I we, we're, oh, my God. It sounds like we're trying to sound brave or something. It's not like that. It, it was really undramatic, except when we threatened to quit. So the, that's <laughs> the only, you know, otherwise it was all just, you know, we, we get away with a lot. And and I imagine you you may even find it more difficult. Other other uh, sacred cows uh, that you take on, you may have more concern with, and maybe even inside the United States. Uh, again, I, I, the reality is we're left pretty much alone in in those terms. It, especially since we're now on a streaming service. When we were on network, it was more of an issue, but again, that, that was about network standards and broadcast standards and things around nudity and such. But mm. it really, in terms of the political statements we wanna make, we really haven't been held back as much as one might think. No, and Alan Dershowitz suing us. So, you know, we we weren't held back there. So that was on another subject. So it just, I think it comes with the territory. <laughs> that sounds like a, a subject for another episode. Uh, <laughs> to Rebecca, I, as uh, Eric mentioned, China passed North America as the largest film market two years ago. And that gap, I think, grew last year. But Hollywood is taking a small edge, smaller percentage of that, according to your reporting. I actually read that in one of your stories. What are the implications of that for the studios, but also, you know, for viewers? It's interesting. Yeah, the percentage of imported films overall, let alone Hollywood films, is shrinking. It, you know, in, in 2019, it was about a quarter of all films played in China were imported foreign features. And last year it was just 13%, so that's much lower. Um, and the implication is that, you know, there's just going to be less cultural exchange between uh, the two countries and that Hollywood has increasingly less leverage. Um, already it was difficult um, for Hollywood to renegotiate. So basically in, in 2012 was the last time there was a significant move on um, new rules to sort of set out what Hollywood is allowed to do in China. Um, at that time, uh, President, then Vice Presidents, uh, Xi Jinping, now Presidents Xi Jinping and Biden, uh, agreed on uh, uh, to, to raise the quota of films allowed into the country from 20 to 34, um, adding special format films like IMAX and 3D. Um, and that was supposed to be renegotiated in 2017, but uh, renegotiations were derailed by the trade war, by Trump's trade war, and they haven't really begun uh, to yield any fruit since. And basically the consensus is among those who are involved uh, and those with knowledge of the matter is that there's going to be basically no movement on it uh, in the near future, especially since uh, the trade war is more concerned with, you know, soybeans and uh, corn at the moment than it is, uh, you know, with Hollywood and, and film imports. Um, and so you have a situation where Hollywood for years, China really needed Hollywood to keep its turnstiles spinning. Um, and now um, you're kind of reaching a point where I personally don't think China's ready to totally break off this marriage of convenience with Hollywood yet. Um, there's still a ways to go before domestic films are strong enough to really sustain a market of that size and growing, um, growing rapidly. And um, but Hollywood has has less sway if there's you know fewer 
percentage, of, if less of the box office percentage is coming from Hollywood films, there's less leverage that um, the MPA and other players are going to have going into any sort of negotiations if they ever even come up. I'm curious about the audiences in China. What do they want? What do they want to see? Do they prefer locally made films to foreign films now? Um, and, and and how is that Chinese film industry doing? The Chinese film industry is doing very well. Um, it is still the world's largest, uh, as it was last last year was the world's largest, and the year before as well. Helped along in large part due to the pandemic, and mostly impressively off the back of local films. Um, there's a mix of, you know, just what is let in in the first place. Um, last year was a particularly fraught year because it was the 100th anniversary of the ruling communist party. And so more so than in typical years, you had a moratorium on foreign titles, the big Marvel movies and so on, um, because they had to make way for local propaganda movies that celebrated the party and its achievements. Um, but the thing is those movies, Back in the day, um, they used to employ a sort of crude method of just, you know, just a roster of big name stars, shoving them into something that looked a little bit like a blockbuster and trying to call it a day. Um, nowadays, the, the propaganda movies known as main melody films are much more sophisticated and watchable, frankly. You have all sorts of genres cropping up since sort of a watershed year in 2019. You have, now you have main melody propaganda movies that are, like The Bravest, which is about firefighter rescuers. You have The Climbers, which is about an, an expedition to Mount Everest. Uh, you have um, The Captain, which is a harrowing tale of a pilot who lands a plane against all odds and saves the day. You have, um, of course, historical dramas that are the sort of bread and butter of that genre, telling people the history of the Communist Party, but employing young stars, the biggest names in the Chinese um, movie scene to sort of spice up uh, otherwise dull history. And they're becoming more and more watchable. And so you see, for instance, that one of the biggest films of the second largest film in the world last year was Battle of Lake Chongjing, um, Chongjinghu, which, uh, you know, was one of the highest grossing films off the back of ticket sales, basically in China alone, um, telling the story of uh, a Korean war episode in which uh, Chinese the Chinese volunteer soldiers um, were sent off to fight uh, Americans and shoot them down. So uh, these movies are, are watchable and people are going and buying tickets and voting with their pocketbooks um, because they are becoming more and more sophisticated. They're employing Western know-how in terms of post-production and, and other types of skills that uh, the Chinese industry has learned over the years to create something that looks um, plausibly like Hollywood. Does it have, do they, do those movies have much of a, an international, uh, do they, are they making any inroads internationally or is, I mean, the market in China, I guess, is so big that it maybe doesn't matter, but. It's interesting. You know, is, I, I, yeah, I go see these movies in New York here, actually, just because it's good to see things on the big screen. And Typically it's me, any time of day, it's me and maybe like a couple, a Chinese couple and maybe one random curious person. Uh, they're not <laughs> super well attended. The box office is pretty much entirely uh, coming from China and they don't travel very well, um, especially the historical titles that are pretty jingoistic and, um, you know, would be a really hard slog, especially when, I mean, some of them are hilariously um, also, you know, they, they're trying, they don't they have a shortage of American actors. So they're employing some Eastern Europeans some Brits, you know, just kind of cobbling together their American cast. Um, so these are things that are clearly trying in, there's a lot of Chinese rhetoric about uh, trying to get Chinese films to go abroad and, and, and to win hearts and minds abroad. But um, for the moment, the most important market for these Chinese films is the local market where there are enough ticket goers to really sustain them already. Um, so it's really uh, more for all of that rhetoric about, um, you know, 中国电影要走出去, that Chinese films should go out into the world. Um, the vast majority of these films are intended as messaging for a domestic audience, very clearly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And actually, Eric, in your book, you talk a lot about that, too, about uh, the cultural, you know, the battle, the global battle for cultural supremacy. But 
China seems content to, at least at the moment, to you know achieve that supremacy within its own borders. What is what is the future there? What is your what are your what are your thoughts on that? I think it depends on where you look because I think Rebecca is absolutely right that it is a very hard sell in the U.S. and and I think in the West in general. Um, what I was struck by was how the Belt and Road Initiative, which is obviously uh, often described as the what it is, which is this collection of trade deals throughout parts of Asia, Africa, Latin America, even Eastern Europe, that is reorienting global trade routes around the world. What I was shocked to learn was just how much there is a cultural complement to so many of those efforts. And, and frankly, I've been thinking a lot about it over the past 48 hours with what's happening in Ukraine, because if you want to see like where China's alliances are forming or dissolving, oftentimes you can look at who they're trying to make movies with. Um, as the Belt and Road Initiative proliferated, a lot of co-production treaties were signed with uh, Pakistan. Um, you know, relevant to this week, I remember um, going to Shanghai on a reporting trip and reading in my hotel in the new in newspaper that morning that uh, Putin had sent Xi Jinping ice cream for his birthday. And then later that same day, I went to a party that was being thrown for a Chinese-Russian co-production film that was being made. And I just have to add, happened to be starring former California governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, and so it was just this, this example of how on, on screen, China often tries to reflect it, the political alliances it's forming off screen. And, and if you go to parts of Africa, this is particularly true because Africa is really the continent that the Belt and Road Initiative has the most ground to gain. And there's this initiative known as the 10,000 Villages Project, which is a Beijing initiative to outfit 10,000 African villages with low-cost Chinese satellite dishes. And these are satellite dishes that carry all sorts of channels, but they also carry a lot of Chinese entertainment. And so I would travel far outside cities like Nairobi to villages inside Kenya, walk into apartments and see families watching Chinese soap operas, Chinese Kung Fu, Chinese reality shows, all of which had been provided on these subsidized satellite dishes. As Rebecca was saying, I don't necessarily know if it, it, is, it is what a lot of these families would be watching in a free market of appeal, but China is paying to close the gap in a lot of places. And by, by as I said, by subsidizing the dishes, by paying to dub these films into local languages that are too uh, spoken by too few people to be justified dubbing into English. Um, there's there's a, an effort to close that gap that I think is also being reflected by what's happening diplomatically, which is setting up this contrast for leaders of these Belt and Road countries saying, which you know, ideology do you want to align yourself with? What superpower do you want to align yourself with? And when it comes to soft power, this has had a real test over the past half decade. I, I, I'll just leave you with one thing, which is that whenever I was in Kenya, I was meeting with their film minister. Um, a guy, I mean, so socially conservative, he makes Ted Cruz look like he should be on Fire Island. And this guy was had CNN on when, when I was talking to him in the office. And Trump was being impeached for the first time during my visit. It was January 2020. And he looked at the TV and he looked at me, the American reporter, and he said, does this really look like the cleaner system? And this is the guy who's deciding what movies and TV shows he's going to import into his country. To what, that's interesting. To what extent do you think Hollywood still needs China, the China market? Is it still important or... Is there a chance that in some ways Hollywood is giving up on that? I'm 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 with I'm with Rebecca on the other on the other side of this marriage of convenience. I don't think either party wants to leave. And I think that um even if it is more uncertain than ever and it feels like the risk is higher than ever to work in China, it still feels like the market, especially for these theatrical films, are is just too big to ignore. Um and that the chances of getting a movie into China are still worth it. And, and that whenever you're making a film that is 250, 300 million dollars to produce, you should still try as hard as you can and avoid whatever you need to, to try and sell tickets in China. 
That's interesting. Um, Michelle and Robert, uh, back to you guys. The um, Tell us a little bit about how you feel about, I mean, you've talked about, you feel, you guys feel free to pretty much write what you want. And, and but you do have a lot of cloud in the industry. I wanted to just circle back to that and, and ask if you feel like there has been any change in that environment, in the freedom of expression uh, component of what people who do teleplays and screenplays in Hollywood do. Has that, is that changing any, in any way, either because of international forces or domestic forces? Well, before we answer that question, can we ask Eric, what did you, what did you answer about uh, what does this seem like the uh, cleaner system? I want to hear the end of that story. I think that's a great question. I mean, I was in total interview mode, uh, so I think I probably turned it back on him and said, "You tell me." Um, but I mean, his, his I mean, his answer was implied, right? He 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 told me that um, you know China for him as as someone who was a leader and who was in judge. I remember what he was what he said exactly. Actually, he said that um, you know the impeachment of Trump was was an example of how in Western democracies, we didn't respect the leader and how he could see that filtering down into a world where children don't respect their parents. Um, and so that was kind of his political justification for preferring China's mode of governance. And then he, because he was so socially conservative um, and especially had a, a, just like an absolute hatred of um, homosexuality and, and was really on guard for any messages or any films or entertainment that he thought were laced with homo homosexual messages. He thought that China had the better um, sort of set of family values. Um, he said to me at one point that he loves importing Chinese films because they've already been censored. Um, and so his, his, um, you know, his, his decision had been made. I just happened to be the closest American. <laughs> so so I, I didn't really put myself in a position to have to defend one or the other. Uh, to answer your question, I think the bigger concern is domestically because the more um, streaming has, becomes about conglomerates, the fewer buyers you have and the fewer people who can make overall deals, which often protects you. Um, if you're always trying to censor yourself because you're going to please a conglomerate, especially a conglomerate that has, you know, trying to protect their brand. So they're not trying to offend people or offend countries or so there often is self-censorship because there aren't as many buyers as there were. And I thought Robert was going to say something slightly different in terms of the focus being domestic. Uh, in terms of what's changed the last 10 years, I think there is more awareness in Hollywood of not only broadcasting for what would be termed coastal elites that it's important not to ignore the middle of the country. Hmm. That's, in that's interesting. Um, I think we can go to um, some questions from our audience. Um, let me just put my finger on those. Uh, the first question is uh, from Will. He asks, what strategies can creators, filmmakers, writers, et cetera, use to play by the rules of Chinese censors while also producing content with integrity? Robert, I don't think you Michelle, can. I think that's uh, Yeah, I mean, I think you can't. I mean, if you, if unfortunately CBS censored that cartoon because it would have given you an instruction of the things to avoid, uh, but I, I don't think you can do it with integrity. Um, you know, I think the thing to do is do a farce and do comedy, but don't touch upon anything that might uh, go too risque. But really, do I don't know. I don't think that's something I maybe want to answer, but maybe you would because you're more diplomatic. No, I, 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 I don't even, <laughs> I'm not even sure what that would look like. I mean, frankly, we've not been asked to play by the rules of the Chinese censors and have never attempted to play by the rules of the Chinese censors. 
So I'm not even sure what that would look like. I think the problem is, as you guys have already been pointing out, there's a lot of guesswork too, because the thing that matters today doesn't matter tomorrow. I don't, and then the vice versa. So I just don't, if you're always kind of scared of your own shadow, I don't know what you would do, but I'd love to hear the other, um, what Eric and Rebecca would say. Rebecca, what do you think? Um, I think the only way to play by the Chinese censors' rules with integrity is to avoid the Chinese censors' rules. Um, so yeah, so I guess either you make a monster movie or you make a popcorn something. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I guess we have, it's an interesting question. I think, um, I'm trying to think, um, uh, one example that's interesting that comes to mind is a recent film uh, that was in Cannes Uncertain Regard um, this summer. It was called Money Boys um, by CBE. And it was a film that was, uh, he, CBE is a China-born filmmaker who uses a pseudonym to protect his family, um, many of whom are still in China. Um, but he's an Austrian citizen who's most comfortable speaking German. And his film was financed by um, Austrian and other European funding. But it tells it's it's set in China and it tells the story of a uh, Chinese Chinese money boys um, of young men from the countryside who go to the big cities and make their living by um, turning tricks, and so uh, you have this very sensitive topic, um, a real life topic that um, is very you know as common as prevalent the one that you encounter in in real life in China that he was interested in exploring. And he did it by using foreign financing, by using his foreign passport, um, and also by setting the whole thing, even though it was set in China, shooting it all in Taiwan. Um, <laughs> so you have some incongruous things like uh, they're supposed to go back to one of their ancestral villages, and you have very Beijing accents mingling with very Taiwanese accents, mingling with something in between that's supposed to be the actual local dialect. Um, so you have these moments that aren't, aren't totally kosher maybe, but but you do have a film that's a very gritty and, and intense treatment of a very taboo subject. Um, so I kind of expect to see more things like that in the future, more models of uh, filmmakers who have an interest in telling uh, important or sensitive uh, Chinese stories, finding ways around the global film industry to, to still get those stories told, whether that means you have some Taiwanese accented Beijing policemen in your shots or, or not, um, I think at the end of the day, that'll probably be worth it as the news tightens within China and makes it harder for local creators as well, um, let alone, you know, I think we've spoken a lot about foreign creators, but locally it's also difficult um, and increasingly difficult for creators to, to navigate this, which is, you know, a landscape just as opaque to them as it is to us. Um, so, um, yeah, so maybe maybe more examples of hybrids and, and um, um, ways of telling Chinese stories that don't involve China. Actually, yeah, that, that's a good point. And I, I wonder, Eric, what are, uh, if you could tell us sort of what are the rules? What are the, what are the rules now? It seems like it's very, you know, it's very opaque and it's difficult to tell. Right, and and at any time you think that there is a rule, there's some movie that's been approved for release that completely refutes it. Um, you know, it as I said, it it ranges. There's a bit of a spectrum. I mean, in some cases, there are actual um, codicils that are put out by by government authorities that will outline what movies can and cannot have, and some of the rules are pretty easy to interpret, like no masturbation. Like you can read a script and figure out if that's going to be a problem. Um, but then others might say other other rules are just more nebulous and say things like don't you know will not present a negative outlook on life or something that will that you know a screenwriter really couldn't figure out if he or she is is breaking. And when it comes to to Hollywood, as I, we've seen, some, I mean, obviously there are some like these political third rails that that no screenwriter hoping to get a movie into China is ever going to explore, whether it's. Tibet or demonstrations in Hong Kong, uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Um, I mean, I think those topics are probably so radioactive that not only would no movie want to explore them, but I don't think any of the studios that want to do any business overall in China would explore them um, in any film um, or else they'd risk being being banned from the country. And so there's there's those political sensitivities, but but what I've also been fascinated to learn about is how sometimes 
thematic uh, issues can emerge that I think few Westerners would have anticipated. Um, one example is in the one of the sequels to Men in Black. Uh, you might remember that the the uh, secret agents played by Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones have at their disposal this device that wipes the memory of any civilian when he or she sees an alien. Um, and when the film was submitted for release in China, that had to be removed because that science fiction device of the memory scrubber was too apt a metaphor in a world or in a country that is constantly trying to control how its citizens remember history and remember what they've seen with their own eyes. And so, you know, as I said, so some things, you know, you can read the script and you know that's not going to fly. But other times, I think there are tropes and narrative devices and I'd say values, frankly, so encoded in American storytelling that we would never we would never know that it was it's going to be an issue for the censors. That's interesting. Um, the next audience question I have is from Tara. And she asks, do you anticipate more films shooting in China by U.S. companies and projects for worldwide distribution? Rebecca, maybe you can take that on. More films shooting in China. So American films shooting in China. Do we right. anticipate that? No, I do not anticipate that they will be <laughs> shooting in China and neither, uh, unfortunately, do the Chinese. Um, there was a time when uh, when Wang Jianling first, uh, the high-flying you know, um, CEO of uh, Dalian Wanda, uh, which set up and ran the sort of Hollywood of the East so-called um, set of studios um, in Qingdao, on the on the coast uh, coastal city, um, that he uh, he made a lot of promises, saying initially when they first opened up the studios there in Qingdao that you know Hollywood films would be flocking there, and you know Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and everyone would be headed over. Um, that never really materialized. And when I last visited the Qingdao studios in maybe 2019. Um, they had been, Wanda was out of the picture. The, the studios were now purchased and run by a company called Sunak Culture, also a real estate developer. Um, and they had very clearly turned away from the idea that foreign productions were going to be flocking to China with all of its restrictions and sort of still growing pains, let's say. Um, and were focusing on domestic productions, of which, happily for them, there were a growing number and so many growing in size that all their world-class facilities, which are really very impressive and very large, uh, since China likes being both the largest and the biggest and the you know uh, the most superlative. Um, uh, so there were enough Chinese productions of a caliber and a scale to use those facilities that they didn't really need to attract um, foreign productions. And you see that when foreign productions do work in China, they often run into unexpected pitfalls. I mean, there's just the difficulty, first of all, of producing in China compared to anywhere else, even, for instance, Taiwan, where the system is more westernized and it's a bit easier for people to, to get a handle on collaborating together. Um, but for instance, when Mulan, Disney's Mulan, uh, the live action film shot in China, they obviously wanted to get amazing shots of the landscape and to have it feel really authentic uh, to place. Um, but they ended up in a huge snafu where um, perhaps you remember this from a year or two ago, but they ended up thanking the local authorities in Xinjiang in the region where they had filmed for some of the desert scenes. And those very authorities were on the U.S. list of sanctioned entities who are involved in perpetrating uh, acts of genocide. So, you know, and that just happened because the local production team ostensibly said, oh, well, typically we thank the local authorities for their, because you can't film anywhere without uh, their approval. Um, and so you might get these uh, awkward uh, culture clashes even when you're really doing your best to be well-intentioned and to be inclusive. Um, so I think that in addition to just the difficulties, if you shoot anything in China, you have to have your script even if it's a foreign film for foreign consumption, your script has to be approved ahead of time before you're officially allowed to shoot, uh, leading a lot of productions to sort of shoot quietly without submitting their uh, their script for approval, um, sort of on the fly illegally. Um, there's just a lot of red tape and restrictions that make it very difficult, let alone new geopolitical realities and our new COVID realities where you know bringing people into the country 
is a massive expense because tickets to China right now from New York are like $8,000 per person. Uh, and you have to quarantine once you arrive for 42 days, or I don't know how, how long it is, but a good month of your life uh, spent uh, in quarantine. So just the idea of bringing a crew um, over to China, given the current COVID circumstances, is extremely impractical. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Bria. And Bria asks, what do you believe are the possible future implications, if any, of the Chinese government censorship laws on the United States film censorship norms? It's kind of an interesting thought. Eric, you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think I, th I think that the I have to say I think that the the effect is quite calcified at this point. I mean, I think at all of the the major studios trying to get films into China, um, this is baked into the process. When when a movie is being greenlit for production, they they have a meeting where they where a bunch of executives get together to justify making this film, and they will say, you know, we are anticipating making X amount of money in the U.S. and Canada. X amount of money in the rest of the world, and then X amount of money in China. China is now important enough to get its own column um, in these in these green light meetings. And so I think whenever you're already dealing with an economic reality like that, the the censorship laws are going to be baked into that to that process because no one wants to arrive in a situation where they have to hastily change a product, change a script, or edit out a scene you know, in the days before a film is 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 set for release. I think it's already happening at a at a pre-production level to a large extent. I think the 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 question that the studios are going to find themselves in is that and I think that the reason why this topic makes so many Americans so queasy is because it's just not what Americans have expected Hollywood to do. Fairly or not, over a hundred years, Americans have grown to expect Hollywood to sell America to the world and to have something of an America first mentality. Um, this happened, I think, most deliberately in World War II when directors were sent to the front lines to, you know, for directors like Frank Capra and John Huston were sent to the, uh, to the front lines to record footage that was sent back and shown in movie theaters around the world. Then through the Cold War, when you know seemingly every movie had a Soviet bad guy, and the um, and the American comedy or the American drama about life in the U.S. was the best possible commercial for living here, um, we've we've come to expect Hollywood to be a tool of American soft power. And so, whenever stories emerge of China corrupting that soft power or influencing that soft power, Americans have this kind of visceral response that I think. Is is hits more emotionally than if we find out about some intellectual property malfeasance in the tech or manufacturing industry. It's because we've expected these studios to become these hearts and minds factories that I think that people running the studios don't um, agree with. Really, I think they see themselves as putting out global products and serving often global shareholders and global parent companies. Um, so I don't think. They want to be conscripted. All of which is to say, I think that these this this could clash if there gets to be more political pushback in the U.S. to some of this appeasement that's being done for the Chinese authorities. I think some of these studios are going to have tougher and tougher questions along the lines of what Rebecca referenced with the filming in Mulan example. I think we we may see more and more of those cases emerge where every time one of these stories comes out about a Chinese, or I'm sorry, about an American film being influenced by China, that there's more and more bipartisan backlash to those to that behavior. Makes sense. <clears throat> Michelle and Robert, do you have any thoughts on that other than that you're glad you're in television and not in uh, feature films? <laughs> uh, well, I did disagree with Erica. Why I think it makes Americans queasy is because it cuts against freedom. Freedom of expression. Mm. You're not, you're not being allowed to write something you want to write, not because of your own government, which we have laws about, but a, another government, which is, I don't know, it makes me insane that that would be the case. So it's not about queasiness about, you know, you know, show, selling America to the world because I don't believe in that either. It's just having another country decide what we should write. 
So I think the cowardice here is insanely outrageous. And so I guess I'm, I feel anger about this and uh, I don't know what to do about it other than I wish uh, Americans, uh, film companies and TV companies would stand up more and more and push back at a country that is perpetrating genocide. Mm. Rebecca, did you have a thought on that before I move on? Oh, no, it's all right. I feel like I was just, it's its refreshing to hear someone in the industry willing to talk about these subjects and also to, 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 you know, to come down on that front. So. Well, and we may not have a job tomorrow. So if we don't, yeah. you can run. The show. <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. We saw it here first. I think, um, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, well, we have a question from David. His question is, does China's state-sponsored censorship of creatives dovetail with its aggressive, aggressive policies denying the enforcement of foreign intellectual property? And if so, how do you see that changing over time? Mm. Rebecca, maybe you want to? Um, I'm trying to puzzle the question. So I guess, um, of creatives, American creatives, perhaps, um, is what is intended. Yes, um, I think so. <clears throat> um, I think it's two different issues. I think China has done a lot to, uh, for instance, in just this past summer in July, um, China passed a new copyright law that actually took, it's one of the few good pieces of news for Hollywood, um, I think in the past year in terms of regulations and policies um, in which uh, they upped fines for piracy and they made it easier to prosecute piracy by making it the, the burden of uh, proof um, on the infringer rather than on the person accusing the infringer. Um, and that was one of the, the few steps, I think, in a positive direction for Hollywood when it comes to uh, China policy last year or in recent years. Um, it seems to me like there's two separate issues. China state censorship is first and foremost about, you know, governing a narrative that the Chinese Communist Party tells its own people and what they want people within the country to see. And it's sort of a, a, a fallout issue that it happens to because people want to see Hollywood movies. It matters what's in those Hollywood movies um, versus piracy is a problem across the board for all content, including local Chinese content, um, where, you know, uh, even local films, uh, basically the day they come out, they're pirated. It's a huge problem for everyone. And, and, and it's something that the, actually the government has at least had a lot of rhetoric about changing and um, has tried to put a little bit of its might where its mouth is on that issue. Although it's just very, very hard to control because piracy, you know, in as soon as a film comes out, um, in the States on streaming, it's immediately available in China um, and vice versa. So often Chinese films, when they go to festivals, are wary of doing online streamings now that all festivals are virtual and a lot of things are happening online. Um, it's hard to get Chinese films to participate because they know that as soon as they put those resources online, someone somewhere is going to have it and it, their, their film is going to be um, bust. So... Um, intertwined problems, but I think um, perhaps separate um, reasons and, and, and separate um, paths, maybe. Eric, you, you have a thought on that? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think Rebecca hit an interesting point there, which is that oftentimes in the history of, of China cracking down on intellectual property issues, there's usually an incentive for China in there somewhere. Um, yeah. You know, in the, in the, in the late 90s, Hollywood really saw China's the main issue in China being the the piracy market and the the counterfeit DVD and VHSs that were available to buy. Um, and so, and and it wasn't in that those piracy networks and those counterfeit DVD networks weren't really cracked down on by the Chinese government until the Chinese government had an incentive, which was getting people to go to Chinese movie theaters. That that kind of makes me wonder about one other question I had, maybe a last question for this group is, do, what is the kind of movie theater market versus the streaming market in China today? And has, has that had an impact on censorship? 
maybe Eric, you want to start? My understanding is that um, this, I mean, obviously the streaming market in, in China is, is huge. I mean, they have several services that are just have millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of, of subscribers. Um, and they've, they've been quite protectionist of that, of that market. And, and that is a big reason why the number of countries that Netflix is not in is very small and includes North Korea, Syria, and China. It's because the authorities have wanted to protect those, um, those their own homegrown services. And I think that the, the Hollywood studios have, have found certain ways into that market, whether it's by licensing shows. So Netflix has licensed a couple shows to those services, including things like House of Cards that can be shown in China. And for a while, I can remember several years ago, hearing about how the Chinese uh, streaming market was a little bit looser than, than the theatrical one, that the Chinese authorities and the Chinese censors had not yet quite caught up to the streaming market and, and not they were not enforcing their rules on it as much as they were the theatrical market. That I think is changing quite a bit though. And, and I think that's why you see some of these high profile examples like the, um, the alternate ending to Fight Club that proliferated across, uh, across the internet about a month ago. That is an example, I think, of the Chinese authorities knowing that a lot of Chinese eyeballs have gravitated toward those streaming services and that they will need to be enforced with censorship rules as well. Is there much of that kind of that kind of Chinese influence where they just add an ending or or add a epilogue at the end of movies? Does that I know that's happened at least once or twice, but is that common, Rebecca? Do you know? Um, it's pretty common, uh, even for local films. Uh, there's often a pat thing that's added at the end that said, yes, there was this terrible child molestation or terrible murder, but uh, in the end, everything was fine and the authorities fixed it. Um, that's not <laughs> uncommon. I think it's not usually quite as um, abrupt as the Fight Club example that, every, that caught everyone's attention earlier this year, where uh, Fight Club was doctored to say that the bombs never exploded, the police fixed them all, and also everything was resolved by 2012, the year that Xi Jinping came into power. Um, so that was a little bit, um, <laughs> a little too too much, uh, and clearly, and interesting because previously Fight Club had been released in China without that, and so it was a new, uh, a new addendum. Um, but I think I just wanted to add a bit to the streaming versus theatrical um, conversation because that was actually a point that um, I think is quite important that you know that the streamers in China um, are were are very powerful and in fact were in recent years the more interesting players I'd say in terms of China Hollywood exchange you had Alibaba Tencent uh, the big platforms investing in Hollywood content uh, for instance like the Green Book Oscar winning film backed by a Chinese streamer. Um, and you have um, an interesting dynamic where um, there's actually the streamers have become so such big players, almost more so than the typical studios, that um, the, the battle now is a little bit between online streamers and short form video like ByteDance, like what we know as TikTok and they know as Douyin, um, and platforms like Tencent or Yoku, which are more like, you know, the Netflix um, or the Apple TV or what have you um, that we might know. Um, and so you have actually a battle between uh, the streamers and the short form platforms, which are getting increasingly into video as well. And this is exemplified by in 2020, at the very beginning of the pandemic, when the theaters were all shut in China and movies couldn't go um, into the theaters because it was everything was locked down. Um, you had one of the biggest hits of the year. Uh, called Lost in Russia. It was a big Chinese New Year film, which are known to be the biggest money-making films of the year. Um, and instead of waiting until theaters reopened, they cut a huge deal with ByteDance, um, the parent company of TikTok, um, and decided to stream exclusively for free for all viewers uh, on ByteDance's video platform in China. Um, and so this was a huge coup that um, you know, it's like, they're like movie uh, exhibitors actually wrote letters in protest and like some two dozen companies tried to protest this and so on because it set such a crazy precedent um, that brought in addition to in China's landscape, you have streaming versus theatrical, but you even have 
you know, you have the short form versus the long form streamers um, and a battle there. Um, and so I think that's really the area that is most interesting to look at during the pandemic. Um, online movies, which are sort of like B movies, they're called internet movies, um, grew a lot in popularity because they're cheaper to produce and easier to produce and you can kind of turn them out. Um, and those historically have had a bad reputation but are growing in, um, in quality um, and in getting bigger budgets, getting better stars. And so you kind of, historically Chinese TV has been pretty terrible, but now um, you have uh, a trend towards better content there as well. Um, so I'll just, I, I just think it's an interesting space to watch. Um, so, yeah. Very interesting. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Thank you, Rebecca, Eric, Robert, Michelle. This was a terrific conversation. And, and we're very grateful. Before we sign off, I want to remind viewers that you can purchase copies of Red Carpet through our partner bookseller, Skylight Books. Our next event in the Penn Partnership Series will take place at the Festival of Books in person at the University of Southern California over the weekend of April 23rd and 24th. So stay tuned to our website for more details on the festival event and the two remaining virtual events in this series. Thanks again to our panelists and to all of you for joining us. And good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.